Today, Donald Brown's list of accomplishments is long. Novelist, professor, editor, and all-round paragon of Alabama journalism. But in 1959, he was a freshly graduated 23-year-old cub reporter, mainly covering small human interest stories for the Birmingham News. Brown was in awe of the journalists who got to cover more hard-hitting events. On a slow Monday morning at the paper's offices, the police radio squawked that a torso with its face blown away by a shotgun blast had been found in St. Clair County, the second such discovery in two days. An editor told Brown to find out what in hell's happening over there. The youthful reporter grabbed his coat and headed east on US 78 toward the story that would change his career. And at the center of it was a woman who would be dubbed the Alabama Torso Slayer. The crime in today's episode has already been solved. But if you fancy yourself a detective, then I've just the game for you. Murder by Choice. Murder by Choice is a murder mystery hidden object puzzle game set in the current age, wherein you play as Carla Page, a journalist invited by billionaire Ruben Navarro to a party on a mysterious island. Before the fun can begin, however, a murder occurs and Carla takes it upon herself to solve it. I found the story, along with the beautiful artwork, very compelling, and the game is packed full of interactive content. You'll be solving puzzles, traveling across numerous locations and meeting a range of exciting characters. My favorite has to be the stylish Reuben, though his wardrobe could use a tad more tweed. How the story plays out is also entirely up to you, as your choices shape how the tale unfolds. So, instead of getting depressed scrolling through social media, why not dive into the mystery? Murder by Choice is free on iOS and Android and is available to download now. Simply click the link in the description box or scan the QR code on the screen to begin your adventure today. On June the 28th, 1959, a farmer picking berries near an abandoned house in Etowa County spotted something strange. In the boarded up shack's driveway, about 100 yards from US Highway 11 in northeast Alabama, there was a body. Though calling it a body may have been generous. The remains consisted of a torso with no arms and legs and its head mutilated beyond recognition. Unable to identify the victim, the press and police dubbed the unknown male Mr. X. The body was dressed in a tattered undershirt and undershorts, but there was no sign of a struggle at the site of the discovery. Apparently, Mr. X had been killed elsewhere and then deposited at the dilapidated farmhouse, a former hangout used by gamblers and bootleggers until it was padlocked by the local sheriff. An autopsy revealed that Mr. X had died of a shotgun wound to the face, followed by a series of blows to the head with a sharp instrument. The man's arms and legs had been hacked off at the trunk, likely with an axe or a meat cleaver. Though gruesome, the butchery was done like a professional, the state toxicologist said. Mr. X had been dead for about 18 hours before his body was discovered, but had likely only been left at the scene a few hours earlier. Etowa County officials said the case was one of the most crude and brutal murders they'd ever encountered. While police set about producing a rough description of the mutilated man and establishing leads, their workload unexpectedly doubled with the discovery of a second torso the next day. Mrs. James Parklow spotted the body around 11.30 a.m. when she pulled into the yard of her unoccupied rental property on Highway 11 near Whitney. She planned to spend the day sprucing the place up for its next tenant. The victim was nude, save for a rag-like piece of cloth hanging from his neck. Like the first body, this one had been shot at close range. 
the left side of his face blown away before the rest of his head was brutally beaten. His arms and legs had been severed. An autopsy of the sickened victim, dubbed Mr. Y, revealed stomach contents similar to Mr. X, indicating that the men had likely dined together about an hour before their deaths on the evening of June the 27th. When reporter Donald Brown arrived at the Parklow's property in St. Clair County, he found hundreds of officers and civil defence workers combing the area for signs of the victim's missing limbs. They searched wooded areas, empty houses and outbuildings, creeks and lakes to no avail. By the time Brown's article went to print that night, investigators had found no clues to bring them closer to solving the baffling mystery. Was it a gang killing? A gruesome revenge murder? A bootlegging agreement gone wrong? Locals in the tiny communities scattered along Highway 11 were terrified, many locking their doors and drawing the curtains for the first time in years. On July the 1st, Mr. X and Mr. Y were buried in Alabama City Cemetery, their identities still unknown. State investigators commissioned an artist to reproduce the men's faces, a difficult task when the killer had been so brutal in disfiguring them. Mr. X was believed to have been between 55 and 60 years old, 5 feet 11 inches tall and about 180 pounds. He had thinning dark hair streaked with grey, heavy features and a cauliflower ear. Mr. Y was believed to be 55 to 58 years old and was described as being about 5 feet 8 inches tall 190 pounds with yellowish grey thinning hair, a double chin with massive jowls, sunken eyes, a prominent forehead and a thick neck. Both victims had olive toned skin, leading police to believe they may have been of Greek descent. Because the undergarments worn by Mr X were made in Alabama and sold in several towns close to where the bodies were found, investigators believed the men were local residents. They also believed the killer was a local, someone who knew the area well enough to leave the bodies near abandoned homes. The weapons used to kill and dismember the men were typical items found on any given rural Alabama farm. Police also believed that the killer had an accomplice since lifting the torsos would have been difficult to manage alone. In a small rural part of Alabama where everyone knew their neighbours, it seemed inevitable that the bodies would be quickly identified and the killer soon after. But two weeks passed with no answers and Donald Brown reported only theories, failed searches and endless fruitless leads. Then, on July the 15th, two highway patrolmen received a tip about a man who hadn't returned to work at the Army Ordnance Depot as scheduled. Instead, a woman had called and requested that his vacation leave be extended. The patrolman followed the lead all the way to a farm in Rabbit Town, a tiny community within White Plains, Alabama. Nestled behind the farmhouse, the officers found what they were looking for. A ramshackle handmade trailer that was the home of Brothers Lee and Emmett Harper. There were bloodstains on the dirt around the trailer and a patched up shotgun blast through the door. Within hours, police had contacted the men's family and confirmed that the two torsos matched the description of the Harper brothers. On July 17th, reporters crowded around the Rabbit Town farmhouse and watched as the confessed killer emerged wearing an orange dress and her best white shoes. The baffling case that had struck fear into the hearts of Alabamans for three weeks was the work of this 30-year-old woman who took time to say goodbye to her seven cats before climbing into the passenger seat of a police cruiser. Viola Virginia Hyatt was born on February 3rd, 1929, in the same small town where she would later commit two brutal murders. Her mother died when she was just five, 
and Viola's father, Martin, quickly remarried a younger woman with no children of her own. Martin, his new wife, Jessie, and Viola lived on the family farm, where they eked out a decent living, growing corn and cotton and raising pigs and chickens. She was remarkably close to her father, electing to follow him around the farm and learning to butcher hogs and shoot a rifle over helping Jesse with the domestic duties in the farmhouse. Viola loved to read and was often seen curled up on the porch swing with a novel and a cat on her lap. She attended school until ninth grade, dropping out after a disagreement with her teacher. As an adult, she mainly kept to herself, but was known by neighbours to be intelligent, soft-spoken and helpful. In 1952, she invited her boyfriend, Lee Harper, to move his trailer onto the family's farm. Some years later, Emmett joined him. The Harper brothers had grown up near Andalusia in southern Alabama. They'd run a small store and cafe before serving in World War II. Emmett had survived the Bataan Death March in the Philippines, which killed an estimated 17,000 prisoners of war. Following his service, he'd struggled to hold a job and likely suffered from PTSD, a condition that was largely unacknowledged and untreated back then, and some might say, even today. 55-year-old Lee and 48-year-old Emmett were known to be frequent drinkers, and could become loud and rowdy after a night of partying. But they never caused trouble and mostly kept to themselves. Lee had taken time off work for a planned vacation to Andalusia, where the brothers traveled a few times a year to visit relatives. When police first questioned the Hyatt family, Viola claimed she'd driven Lee and Emmett to the bus station in Lee's 1955 Chevy sedan. But after six hours of interrogation, she told investigators she had something to show them. She led them on a three-hour road trip down the Whiskey Trail, a winding series of roads through sparsely inhabited areas of rural Alabama, where she tossed the brother's arms and legs from the Chevy's window as she drove. After recovering four limbs, Viola led police back to the Hyatt farm and reenacted the murders as Martin and Jesse watched from the front porch. According to Viola, she'd gone to the men's trailer just before midnight on the evening of June the 27th. She'd shot Lee first, and then as Emmett leaned over his brother, she'd shot him too. After undressing their bodies, Viola dragged the two men outside where she dismembered them before loading the remains in a homemade wheelbarrow and pushing them to Lee's car. She then placed the torsos in the trunk and piled the limbs in the back seat. On the journey, she'd driven through the Talladega National Forest, discarding the body parts at random intervals before taking Highway 11 through Etowah and St. Clair counties, depositing Lee and Emmett's torsos at abandoned homes about 10 miles apart. Viola showed investigators the back seat of Lee's Chevy, which was still caked with dried blood. She took them to the cornfield where she'd buried the axe used to dismember the bodies. She showed them the wheelbarrow she'd used to move the men's remains. Then she asked to go inside the farmhouse to change her clothes and brush her hair. She said a stiff goodbye to her parents and a warmer one to her dogs and cats before posing for photos. When asked how she'd felt after her confession, she said, I feel better. Viola spent most of her time in prison awaiting trial reading. She refused to speak with police or her attorneys. After a pre-trial hearing, a judge ordered Viola to be sent to a hospital for observation. After five months, she was deemed sane and competent to stand trial, though her defense team issued a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. On March 14, 1960, dozens of people packed into the courthouse in Calhoun County, awaiting the start of Hyatt's trial. Viola had given authorities four reasons for the murders. She claimed that the brothers abused her sexually abused her father and drank heavily. Her final reason 
had been an argument about her using Lee's car. Those in the courthouse hoped to hear more details about what had transpired that day to send her over the edge. But just before opening arguments, the accused changed her pleas to guilty, ending their excitement before it began. She was sentenced to life in prison and never spoke in court, save answering the judge's questions with simple yeses and no's. Viola served just 10 years before being paroled in April 1970. After her release, she moved in with an aunt and uncle in Jacksonville. Her father had died in 1961 and her stepmother just six days before she was granted parole. Though she was only 40 when she was released, Viola never worked again and seldom ventured into town. She developed a serious leg condition and used a walker for the rest of her life. In 1990, she moved to a mobile home park called Tuckaway Village. Residents there called her the mayor because she knew everything that happened watching life unfold as she read on her front porch. Viola died in 2000 at the age of 72. She had refused all interviews, as had every member of her family. Despite the reasons she gave for the murders, many believe there was more to the story. One of those was Donald Brown. 60 years later, he'd quit his teaching job to dive back into the investigation in an attempt to understand the gruesome murders and the soft-spoken woman who'd committed them. Through the years, there have been plenty of theories. A love triangle, abuse, a secret baby fed to pigs. But Viola's motive remains unknown, scattered to the winds along Highway 11 in rural Alabama. Thank you for watching. And thank you to the episode sponsor, Murder by Choice. Right then, take care. And I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.